Praise be to God. Praise the Lord. It's been a few weeks that we've been uh, stepping away from the book of Acts. We will go back to the book of Acts chapter 19 today and continue our series, We Are Witnesses, from the book of Acts. You know, they say imitation is the greatest form of flattery. Um, if someone likes what you're doing and they imitate you, typically that's considered praiseworthy, that you're doing something right. But we'll study a portion here in Acts chapter 19 where there were some imposters, seven sons of Sceva, that were, um, were posers, and we'll learn about them in a sermon that I've entitled, Let's Get Ready to Rumble. Let's Get Ready to Rumble. If you would turn your attention to Acts chapter 19, uh, we'll study verse 11 to 20. 11 to 20. Since it's been a few weeks, let me just give you a little bit of a background. We're studying Paul's third missionary journey. And uh, as part of this missionary journey, he is now in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. And we see that when Paul arrives in Ephesus, he meets 12 disciples uh, that were baptized in John's baptism of repentance. And the last time I spoke, I asked, uh, or the question was asked, have you guys been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And those disciples answered, said, no, we have not even heard of the Holy Spirit. And then we see that Paul takes them and baptizes them in the name of Jesus. And afterwards, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and empowers them. One of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to give us power for living a victorious Christian life. Paul then teaches them in the synagogues uh, for three months, and afterwards there was some uh, opposition, and Paul decides to move his teaching to the hall of Tyrannus, and we know that he, the word of God says he taught there for two years. So for two and a half to three years, Paul had based his ministry in Ephesus, and he is uh, teaching his disciples, and more and more people Around Asia, uh, the Asia Minor is coming to know about the Lord Jesus, and many other churches are being formed. I told you last week that in the Revelation, when in the island of Patmos, John has that vision, all of those churches are in the neighboring towns of Ephesus, and those uh, was very well formed at the time of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. So we see because Paul was not afraid, despite being beaten and shipwrecked and many other things, he continued his mission to the third missionary journey, and now he is being used mightily in Asia Minor, and the gospel is going forward, and there is evangelization taking place. Um, I have a map there that you can show, uh, which showed the um, missionary journey there. If you can look right in the middle of the red, you can see Ephesus which is modern-day Turkey. And if you look around there, you can see all the other churches, Philadelphia, it talks about Sardis, Thyatira, Pergamum, all the churches mentioned in the book of Revelation uh, were churches that were formed by the work of Paul's third missionary journey and the two and a half years, three years that he spent there. But today's um, message would then go on to talk about Paul in Ephesus. And in verse 11, it says, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Remember, who's doing the miracle? God was doing the miracle, but it was just through the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. So Paul is doing a mighty ministry uh, in some versions, it says extraordinary or unusual miracles were taking place. Um, he is sending, uh, or people are taking the clothes that he wore, and there's miracles taking place. And the name of the Lord is being expounded in Ephesus. And then there comes these impostors impos 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 or posers. Then some of the itinerant Jewish 
exorcist undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus and said to the evil spirits, I adjure you by, the, by Jesus whom Paul proclaims uh, to come out. And then seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were the ones doing this. We see that these were itinerant Jewish exorcists. They were the sons of Jewish high priest Sceva, and there were seven of them. All will come in important later. And they are uh, rebuking the devil by saying, by the name of Jesus who Paul proclaims. It is not their own personal uh, testimony, but it is someone else's secondhand testimony. So the evil spirit, interestingly, answers them and says, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? And that's a question that should ring in our mind today. Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, mastered all of them, overpowered them, and they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Such a sad situation for the sons of Sceva. They are wounded, naked, and running out of that house, overcome by the power of the evil spirit. And the next portion goes on to say that this became known all throughout the land, and the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and the Greeks, heard about it, and fear fell upon all of them, and the name of the Lord was extolled because of this. The name of the Lord was glorified. And also many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them, the books, found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver worth millions of dollars in today's value. And the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily uh, among the people of Ephesus. So that's the scripture portion. We'll study um, some important points uh, from this portion. We see that the Holy Spirit gives us the power for victorious living in the world. Apostle Paul, when he came to Ephesus, understood that the disciples, if they did not have the power of the Holy Spirit, they could not withstand the place that they were living in. If you study the history behind Ephesus, we know that it was a place that all kinds of evil, all kinds of false worship, all kinds of idol worship was taking place. And in order for a child of God to have a victorious life, as we learned last time, Paul knew they needed the power of the Holy Spirit, and that is why uh, he baptized them again properly, and then they were able to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Lord is the one who does the miracles, and we are only vessels. If you go back to verse 11, you will see that it says God was doing these miracles. It was not Paul. Paul was just a vessel. Even though Paul was an extraordinary, bivocational man who spent all of his time from morning till night working in the morning, teaching the Bible in the midday, and again working in the evening, um, and was used mightily of the Lord. It was the Lord who did the miracle. And the miracles were only for establishing the name of the Lord. We should not misunderstand that miracles are to be something that we worship or we go after, but they are only for establishing the name of the Lord. So the name of the Lord can be glorified. And we could see that these were extraordinary or unusual miracles for the time. This was before the invention of the telephone or the internet. And Paul could only be in one place. He was a tent maker by morning and night. And he was teaching in the hall of Tyrannus in the afternoon uh, from 11 a.m. to about 4 p.m. for these two years. So Paul could not be everywhere, but the Lord, who is the omnipotent, omniscient God knew that there had to be a way, and that is how the Lord did this extraordinary or unusual miracle. We cannot take this one miracle and say this has to happen every time, or this is a pattern that we need to follow. God in his omniscience knows what is needed for the time. We know that pastors today can pick up a telephone and call before you uh, have a test or you're going for an interview or, or something like that, and the Lord is the one that does the miracle and that it is, they are just the vessels. 
So we should be trusting in God. And uh, uh, even in the time of this pandemic, we've had virtual ways that we could have uh, the touch of the Lord through his servants. And miracles and healing and deliverances were taking place in our midst as well. And evil spirits at that time uh, were departing via the handkerchiefs or the apron or the face towel of Paul. You know, we serve an omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent God. Nothing is impossible for our God. And God knows in his knowledge what is good. And even as we go through many uh, trials, he knows how to sustain us. We then go on to learn about these seven sons of Sceva who were copycats at Ephesus. You can call them fakers or posers or imposters, imitators, secondhand professionals, jaded sons of a high priest, you, whatever you want to call it. Uh, when they saw this extraordinary or unusual miracle being done at the hand of Paul by God, they thought they could also do this. They were, in, after all, people that were itinerant uh, people that would go around from city to city, and their job description was to, uh, in the Jewish faith, to uh, uh, take out devils. So they thought that they could do this as well. And so uh, they only had a second-hand knowledge, possibly, and I'm, I'm guessing at this, that uh, they uh, were not mentioned by name. They were mentioned as the sons of Sceva, and uh, the Lord, uh, uh, the, through the devil, they're saying, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? See, they had a copycat experience. They had a father that was a high priest of the Jews, and uh, um, they did not have a personal relationship, as we heard last week, and they, were, uh, they did not know the Lord Jesus they were Jewish exorcists who did this as a job description. And because of that, we see that they left naked and bloodied. What is the lesson we can learn from this? If we are just posing, no wonder if we feel naked spiritually and bloodied as we go on in this world. It was Billy Graham who said that God has no grandchildren, only children. You can't fake it till you make it when it comes to spiritual matters. Yes? If you're under the law and the religion as the Jewish people were, um, or are you under the relationship that comes with a personal relationship that is won by the victory that the Lord had for us on the cross of Calvary? If you're still out there posing, it's no wonder we feel spiritually naked like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden and felt like they had to cover up. If you're covered under the blood of Christ, uh, you don't have to be bloodied by the attack of the devil because you're already covered by the blood of Christ and you will be victorious. So it is high time that we stop posing, that we stop uh, being second-hand Christians, that we not just talk about our forefathers' uh, spirituality, but we have a personal relationship with God. A part-time faith cannot defeat a full-time devil prowling around to see who he may devour. If you study the book of Luke, it was interesting. Uh, in Luke, as Jesus had removed a demon from a man that was mute, and the demon had gone out, and the man was speaking, there were many uh, people around there that claimed that he had done this miracle out of uh, possession by Belzebub, Belzebul, uh, the prince of the demons. And Jesus said, no way that the kingdom of the, the devil uh, cannot be uh, thrown out by another person. Or kingdom divided cannot stand. And that I cast out the devil by the kingdom of God and by the finger of God. And that the kingdom of God has come to you by my casting out of the devil. I found it interesting in verse 19 that it said, uh, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. And we see that many years later that it is the professional uh, demon chasers, the Jewish people, that were then beat up and bloodied. Um, and that uh, became, uh, I want to say, a fulfillment of what Jesus said. Your sons, who are the professional uh, uh, 
uh, demon chasers were uh, beaten up and, and they became uh, the, your judges of what you're accusing me of, which is by doing this in the name of uh, Beelzebul. Let me uh, bring this back to uh, the portion that I want to uh, emphasize today, which is from Ephesians chapter 1 as well, uh, that says that an immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, working according to his great might, he has worked in Christ when he raised us from the dead. We study the book of Ephesians, and we know that we are adopted in Christ, that we have a great treasure. He has given us great power, and he has given us uh, sonship, and he has raised us from the dead uh, when he raised Christ and when he put him in the right hand of the Father. And all authority and rule and power and dominion above every name that is named is given to our Lord Jesus, and through sonship with him, we have that authority as well. So as children of God, if we are in true relationship with the Lord, we do not have to be afraid of the evil powers uh, that are out there. And pastor, we just prayed about it. Uh, the, the powers of the city, the powers of darkness, they will try their level best. But if we are standing with the victor, which is the Lord Jesus, we will be truly victorious. In Ephesians 6, it reminds us, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. I believe Justin said this last week. Uh, put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For, do, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. You know, many of us go on with our life thinking that it is only what we see with our naked eyes. But there is a spiritual realm, child of God. Believe it or not, whether you see it or not, whether you believe it or not, there is a spiritual realm that is trying their level best uh, to attack you. And if you are in, in your natural man, you might not see it. But it, in your the spiritual eyes, you are in a battlefield. And the Lord reminds us to put on the whole armor of God and stand against the schemes of the devil and wrestle and fight against uh, the, the, the schemes of the devil. And if we are standing with the victor, then we will truly be victorious. Amen. The last portion of that couple of scriptures, we see a, a great expensive bonfire where books were thrown in. After this had happened, there was great fear that seized Ephesus, it says, and news spread to Jews and Gentiles alike. All of Asia Minor started to hear about what had happened. Word of mouth spread quickly, and people heard about what happened to the Jews uh, uh, whose profession was to uh, take out the devil and how they were defeated by the devil themselves uh, and how they were naked and poor, and they uh, understood that there was something peculiar, something special about the name of Jesus, and that there is power in the name of Jesus. There is something to what Paul is teaching, and this is not just something Paul is spending all his time teaching, that there is uniqueness and there's power, and there was great fear all throughout Ephesus, and news spread around to the Jews and the Gentiles alike, and the name of the Lord was held in high honor because of this miracle and wonder that took place. And we see that many came, and first there was open confession, it says, and then they brought their sorcery scrolls, and they burned them publicly. We see that if there is a true repentance, then there is an open confession, and then there is some letting go of some expensive things that is burned publicly. It is not just a secret that you are now a follower of Christ, but because of this, we see that 50,000 silver coins, and uh, when I looked it up, several million dollars in today's money of books were burnt up and not given to, let's say, secondhand books or something like that. So somebody else could read it and go in the wrong direction. So uh, I know that we have such stories uh, among us. As we came forward in the Lord, there were many things that our forefathers had to give up. Many things that we have to give up. If there are things in our life that we're holding on to because they're expensive, but 
uh, coming to the Lord, we have to have an open confession before him. And we, there are some things we need to put aside. And we have to be willing to surrender uh, to the Lord so that he can guide us. Are we willing to burn up some idols or some sorcery in our life? And it will be a serious and costly commitment. As it says in Romans 8, which we were studying uh, in Sunday school, um, there is life in the spirit through Jesus. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And that is the key. We have to walk according to the spirit. The overflow of the anointing of the spirit needs to be what directs us in order to live in modern day Ephesus, which is United States of America today. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, uh, although your body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. The life of Christ is imputed upon us, and we are able to live because of the righteousness of Christ. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the de dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also live through your immortal bodies, through his spirit who dwells in you. For all who are led by the spirit are sons of God. As the worship team is coming up, um, let us uh, look at the last portion there. It says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor uh, things present, nor things to come. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. In a love relationship with Christ, we're able to overcome the powers of darkness. Because Jesus, once and for all, has won the victory on the cross of Calvary. If you abide in him, if you uh, take your refuge in him, he will surely bring you to victory. So you see, we don't just live in a physical realm that we see. There is always a battle and there is always a rumble going on. On one side we have God and on the other side we have the forces of darkness that is always trying to uh, uh, beset us into sin. But if we trust in God, it's a daily process. If we're able to overcome by the Spirit, uh, by trusting in him and only through the spirit and the power of the spirit are we able to overcome. As a conclusion, that same question that came up earlier that said, are you a son of Sceva? That's something that I like to uh, dwell on for a quick second. In Matthew 7, verse 21 and 23, it says, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. That, is not, that should not be our end. We need to have a personal relationship, a first-hand relationship with our Lord. If we're here posing, we're coming to church on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, we're uh, lifting up another name. Then it is high time that we examine ourselves and make a decision to live for the Lord. And to live for the Lord will not be uh, easy. It is a daily struggle with the help of the Holy Spirit that we're able to do it. May the Lord bless you with these words.